Chapter 30, One Crazy Summer, The Third Thing. Who would have thought 20 flyers could have brought more than a thousand people to the park? Talk about a grand Negro, well, a grand black spectacle. People simply came, filling up every inch of the green in the park. Some of them even climbed oak trees and perched in branches for a good spot. Everywhere you turned, there were college students in t-shirts signing people up for sickle cell anemia testing and voter registration. Black Panthers from around the country in sky blue t-shirts with pictures of Black Panthers on them stood tall patrolling the park. Policemen also stood tall holding on to their wooden clubs. And yet, I wasn't afraid. I was excited. You see, Sister Makumbu said, waving her bangled arm like a wand over the hundreds of people, maybe thousand, maybe a thousand. I feel ashamed of the pride I take in ironing a crease extra sharp. Ironing a crease is a job well done. Bringing people to this rally was magic that had you soaring above the trees. It certainly was worth marching up to the no-sayers. In my mind, all these people came to the rally because of our summer camp helped to spread the word. The idea of radio announcements, the Black Panther newspaper, and word of mouth hadn't entered my mind. If only Cecile could see what we've done. And Pa and Big Ma. They put the young people's presentations on first, before all of the speeches and the musicians and the adult poets. Our play was awkward, with Sister Pat following us around with a microphone, but we continued on as if we rehearsed it that way. The first time Janice Ankton heard her voice boom out over all those loudspeakers, she jumped back. She soon overcame her amplified voice and proved a bigger hand than Vanetta on her showiest and crowiest days. Janice brandished her silver, silver cap gun at us, tired and scared runaway slaves more than Sister Pat's script had called for. All I knew was that the crowd liked it, and that was enough for Harriet Tubman, who proclaimed, either you want to be free or you want to be scared slaves. She was supposed to have said, I haven't lost a passenger yet. The crowd went crazy, and Janice soaked it up. Eunice kicked her sister the way I sometimes had to put Vanetta in her place. It worked. Janice stopped waving her silver cap shooter at us and went on with the play as Sister Pat had written it. After Harriet Tubman freed the slaves, Hirohito and the boys showed off their karate kicks and chops and jiu-jitsu moves. Eunice, Janice, and Beatrice changed into their matching African print head wraps and dresses sewn by their mother. I was certain Vanetta would be eaten up with jealousy after Janice's loud dramatic performance was soon to be followed by her dancing in that cute matching outfit. Instead, Vanetta had been awfully quiet when we waited for our turn to go on stage. I feared the worst with Minetta's sunken mood. This had happened just before the tip-top-tap disaster. A quiet Minetta was a scared Minetta. That meant I'd have to dance her part, or in this case, say her part, if her eyes bugged out and her mouth didn't open. Then afterward, I'd have to say they're there to her for the next two weeks. Minetta, are you ready? She nodded. If I didn't make her talk, we were doomed. What's that, Minetta? Another nod. Now I was mad. Mad because this was the same Vanetta who had stubbornly wanted to sing Dry Your Eyes before all of these people. This was the same Vanetta who had recited We Real Cool until it drove Cecile into a cussing fit. This was Vanetta who had said we should do this poem. And as usual, I would have to go out there and finish the mess Vanetta started. Vanetta, don't make me kick you. Better not, she said. Good. At least her mouth opened and two words came out. And I'm ready for your information. I'm ready for him pipes up. I'm ready like Freddy. I'm ready and steady. I know a boy in my class named Eddie. Eddie Larson, but Larson doesn't go with Freddy and steady. And then she barked, Erf, Erf. Vanetta and I looked at each other and then at Fern. Vanetta said, Fern, what are you talking about? Fern smiled and sang, I saw something. She, then she clapped it out like we were still on the East Bay bus. The karate boys had run off the platform while the crowd still cheered. I hadn't been paying attention because I was worried about Vanetta. But when Hirohita ran over, I said, that was really neat. Sister Pat pushed us on stage, and we marched out before all those people. 
Bonetta was supposed to introduce uh, introduce us and say the name of our poem and that our mother had re- wrote it. But I could see her eyes growing big and her face ashen. I whispered two things I knew would get her going. I said, Hirohito's watching and Janice hopes you trip. Minetta's face ripened to a peach. She grabbed the microphone pole like Diana Ross, stepped out in front of us, her Supremes, and then cleared her throat. I birthed a Black nation by our mother, Nazilla, the Black poet. All the power to all the people. The crowd roared and waved their fists. Maybe they carried on because she was a little girl making big sounds. Maybe they cheered for Nazilla, who was now a known political prisoner. To Vanetta, they cheered for her, and she was set to show and crow. Vanetta, I birthed a Black nation. From my womb, Black creation spilled forth to be stolen, shackled, dispersed. Me, I dispatched Black warriors, raged against unjust barriers, to find the Black and strong had fallen, Divided, deceived, overcome. Fern, black oceans separate us. Tortured cries, songs of black greatness still echo in my canal. Veneta, Fern, and me hear the reverberation of a stolen black nation forever lost to foreign shores where thieves do not atone and Mother Africa cannot be consoled. All that was missing was Cecile to see and hear us recite her poem. I'm sure she wouldn't appreciate it if Vanetta sprinkling black into her poem like Pepper. But the crowd loved it, and we went along following Vanetta's lead, throwing the word black as she had. Following each other was easy. We'd been doing it for as long as we could talk. Saying Cecile's words, one after another, felt like we were bringing her into our conversation instead of turning our voices on her like we had. When we finished, we were supposed to exit the platform. Me first, Vanetta second, and Fern last. We walked off the stage over to the wing. That was what I was certain we'd done. And then I turned and saw Fern still standing in the center of the stage. I went to get her, but Sister Pat was already walking out. Fern wouldn't leave. She said something to Sister Pat, who nodded and adjusted the microphone down to Fern's mouth. Then she left Fern alone on stage. The crowd quieted and waited, but Fern stood without saying a word. Again, I went to get little Fern, but Sister Macumbu grabbed my shoulder. Wait, Delphine, let her. Sister Macumbu had no idea how hard it was for me to watch my baby sister stand alone before all these people. They could laugh at her, shout at her to get off stage, or boo her into tears. But Fern bawled her fists banged them at her sides, and then she spoke. My mother calls me little girl, but this poem by Fern Gaviar, not little girl. This is a poem for crazy Kelvin. It's called A Pat on the Back for a Good Puppy. She cleared her throat. Crazy Kelvin says, off the pig. Crazy Kelvin slaps Everyone five. The policeman pats crazy Kelvin on the back. The policeman says, good puppy. Crazy Kelvin says, arf, 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 arf. Because I saw the policeman pat your back, crazy Kelvin. Surely did. Two things happened just then. Really three things. First, the crowd went wild for Fern Gavier. Jan Sancton folded her arms and told Eunice she didn't want to go on stage and dance after Fern had grabbed up all the applause. Second, Crazy Kelvin backed away. I think he was searching for the best way to get out of the park, but he was surrounded by Black Panthers. They knew what Fern had said, even though it took Vanetta and me a little longer to really understand what Fern had said and seen and what it meant. Lucky for Crazy Kelvin, there were enough police to step in and get him out of the park. So before I go to the third thing, let's just look at this poem again that that Fern said. 
The policeman pats Crazy Kelvin on the back. The policeman says, good puppy. Crazy Kelvin is what we like to call a mole, an informant. He was part of the Black Panthers, but he was going back to the police and telling them all the things the Black Panthers were doing. He was informing the police and probably getting paid for it. So, it's funny about Crazy Kelvin. If he hadn't gone on and on about racist pigs, Fern would have never asked herself what's wrong with this picture. I'm sure it had to do more with Miss Patty Cake and him telling her who she could love. I'm sure it had more to do with him telling her who she was. Fern had Crazy Kelvin in her sights and she got him with his own words. What's wrong with this picture? There was a third thing that happened just then, only I didn't know it at the time. Cecile told me, told it to me in a letter a month later. And that thing, the third thing, was a poet had been born. It wasn't Longfellow Cecile had written, but it was a running start.